Um, it had nothing to do with the mandate of his position, which was this one-time commissioner of agriculture position that started in 1888. He just came up with it. And he um, publicized it to the newspapers that he was going to be generating rural Vermont by bringing in sweets. And it became this big news story. And he kept referring to Vermont's farms as abandoned farms. And just gave people this picture of Vermont just being, rural Vermont being desolate, like this horrible picture. And uh, um, there was a lot of things that Vermonters found offensive about this. I mean, on the one hand, he's describing rural Vermont as this like nightmarish place full of terrible people. And also, he was trying to bring in these Swedes. And a lot of people say, why are you spending all this money bringing in Swedes? Why don't you give the money to local boys? They could use the farms. They can't afford farms, and they want to stay. But he pressed on. He brought a guy from Nebraska who was a Swede, who settled colonies of Swedes out in the Midwest. And the guy did a tour of Vermont. And then he went off in the winter to Sweden. He went to his hometown. And in the meantime, this became really big news. It became big news around the country because it was kind of a news of the world thing. But one of the, the, the real byproducts of this was that the word got out that Vermont farms can be had for super cheap. That they're really cheap. Can you say that again? They're really cheap. Oh. They're really affordable. And he began to get these tons of letters, tons of letters from around the country. And it was from people not inquiring about whether they could have farms for farming on for agriculture. They wanted them to stuff it as second homes, as summer homes. Yeah. And so he set up in the state also, he publicized the availability of Vermont farms around the country. He gathered the first comprehensive list of Vermont farms for sale, first one ever to do that. And he established a network of contacts in lots of towns to whom he could forward these letters inquiring about second homes, about summer homes. And he actually did, then, in the summer of 1890, bring over something in the neighborhood of 55 suites, husbands, wives, children, mostly young families. And he broke them up into three colonies. Big news, people were following this progress. And he dropped them down into three columns, one in Berkshire, one in Wilmington, and the one that I followed, which was supposed to be in Weston. But he actually dropped them down just south of Weston in a town called Landgrove, where there was a um, lumbering operation that was looking for people to work. Now, this is the question. Has anyone ever heard of Landgrove? You're pretty close here. Not many people have. When you get up to like St. Albans, people are like, and I've spent a lot of time there the last couple of years. It's a wonderful, wonderful place. Um, it was a poor town. It was a town that went bankrupt at one point and had to be built up by the state. It was a town that had about eight residents. Um, of the 47 taxpayers, 23 of them were delinquent. I mean, it was a, the wrong side of the tracks was its reputation. So we dropped some down in Land Grove, and then we went to the legislature to have this position renewed in that fall. The, one town, one vote, like a portion house, which represented mostly rural interests, were like, absolutely not, this is stupid. So they canceled the program, and everyone in Green Vermont to never talk about it again. Um, but what lived on after Valentine was gone was that list of farms for sale, which they kept updating, and the net of contacts, and the publicity. Now, there was a big boom in tourism in the 1890s. Uh, big boom, right? That was the really when Vermont as a vacation place took off. And it happened for a variety of reasons. But Valentine's program definitely uh, did a huge amount to push it forward. And after his position, after he went back to Bennington and began to make women's underwear all over again, he, um, that list of farms that he had, people didn't know what to do with it, so it fell into the hands of the Board of Agriculture. And then for the next 20 years, kind of bizarrely, the Board of Agriculture in Vermont was responsible for promoting tourists in Vermont. They didn't particularly want to, but they're the ones who have the list, and they kept publishing it. Until finally, in 1911, the state established what was called the Bureau of Publicity, which nationwide it was the first state agency devoted to promoting tourism. And off it went. It was located in the Secretary of State's office. And they published all sorts of pamphlets promoting tourism. And you could write in, and they'd send them to you for free. And they began to do really good business. And it was because there was this realization that Vermonters state leaders were having at this point, is that there was a 19th century economy. 
and it was dependent on small dairy farms, extractive industries, lumbering and quarrying, and small manufacturing firms. And it was clear at that point that all three of those sectors of the economy were in decline. And what was going to replace it? Well, some of it, tourism. Yeah, and this is, it was, it was dawning on. And if you follow this story through into the 1920s, what becomes particularly amazing to me is the extent to which the Board of Act, the, the Bureau of Publicity, its leaders, felt happy, overjoyed, about the increasing availability of, Vermont, of, of farms for sale summers. And they would do studies, and they would say, in these five towns, in 1900, there were only four farms for sale. But now there's 60. Isn't it great? <laughs> and the answer is, well, not if you lost that farm. I mean, every farm that's lost is a tragedy for some family. For uh, parents who thought they would hand that farm down to their kids, and for kids who thought one day they would keep you know, multi-generational farms going. But th there's no, it's really callous that there's essentially no recognition of that on the part of, uh, of the Bureau of Publicity. And what the Bureau of Publicity was selling was the scenic landscape, not the human one. It was the scenic one. And they, they would say, Vermont had is America's Switzerland, vacation land. They kept talking about Vermont's cushiony gravel roads. Whatever <laughs> that <laughs> cushiony gravel. <laughs> and I don't know, and, and if you know anything about what Vermont's roads were like in the 1920s, they, they were disastrous. But, um, and and you know, meanwhile, the, the Swedes, um, who settled the land growth, um, at first they flourished as a cute colony. In 1900, there were 32 parents and children among these five families that lived there. And if you'd walked through the North Carolina land growth, you would have heard Swedish spoken. And some of these kids who were born in America all their lives, because I interviewed descendants, they spoke with Swedish accents, you know, because they grew up in this. Um, and, and that's the thing, is that they, and they intermarried with local families. I'm sure Rhonda Valentine would have been horrified to know how many of them married people of French-Canadian heritage. Which is exactly the opposite of what he wanted. Oh, and actually, um, Jenny Westy married her cousin, Julius Westy, you know. I mean, that was the thing, is that they became part of the community in which they were placed. They became indistinguishable from the other people. They inserted themselves into these really strong, um, communities, and the thing about these communities, like any strong community, is that they're not physical. They're not something you can touch. They're built on shared experiences, and that's what communities are, is, is they're, they're long-term shared experiences by people, and that's what, what forms really strong communities. And, but the Board of Agriculture, I mean, the Bureau of Publicity, was not really selling that at all in the 1920s. And it's at that point, in 1929, that Sam Ogden arrived on the scene. And he was looking for, a, he was from New York City, from Elizabeth, New Jersey. His dad sold insurance, so therefore he was going to sell insurance. There was the life that was, that was planned out there. He was in World War I, served in the trenches, and had sort of a, a really big awakening there. So he uh, came back and he worked in insurance, and he hated it because it's all fake experiences, it's all fake relationships with people, country clubs and cocktail parties. What he wanted was a real life, a personal life, a thing where you can do things with your hands. And the one thing that he found that he really liked doing in New Jersey was buying dilapidated houses, fixing them up and selling them off, and flipping houses. And so the, the best thing that could happen to him in 1926 was that his dad died. So he was like, great. And so he then began to plot out what his life would be and he decided that he was going to move to rural America. And while driving with his wife, they ended up in Peru, Vermont, at family friends, and went down into Land Grove because they were told that was the best place to buy cheese. Arrived in the only village in Land Grove, and of the seven houses and two barns in the village, there was one occupied house. All the others were abandoned. And he, he was like, how, how much to buy up the whole village? And the guy said, $4,000. So we bought, we bought the village in early October, 1929. And then the stock market collapsed. And he had nothing left but his village. So they moved up there. And he absolutely loved it. He, so, and his idea from the beginning was he'd renovate these houses and turn them into um, vacation houses. And he wrote 
just a little bit later, he wrote, the thing that endeared Vermont to Mamie and me was the character of her citizens. These were unique human beings, each with his own special stamp, his peculiarities, his crotchets, and his independent individualism. These were people, not stereotypes. Some more peculiar than others, but thank the good Lord, all of them were peculiar. <laughs> he loved the people in Landgrove because they lived the real meaningful lives he was looking for, and he immersed himself in it. If you want to have food, you grow it yourself. If you want to, if you, if you need tools, well, then you start a forage and you make them yourself. If you want good schools for your kids, you get involved in the school and make it better. And most of all, if you want to have good governance, if you want to have good politics in your town, and Vermont back then had really meaningful politics at the town level, you get engaged in town politics. And he saw that this was the thing. The closer, he wrote, the closer the machinery of government is to the people, the more meaning it has, and the more active the participation in the responsibilities of government, the better the citizen. For these reasons, living in the country or in a small rural community brings one to better citizenships. Good better citizenship. And so in the years that came after that, from 1930 on, he got increasingly involved in widening his circle of friends. He became very close friends with Scott Neering, who was the back of the leg up from living with yeah. the butt. Yeah, who lived. They were politically Alan complete Scott. opposites. What's that? Alan and Scott. Alan and Scott, who lived in Jamaica, right next door. Um, he got to know, I mean, Grass Stewart, and he uh, helped to found the uh, Vermont Symphony Orchestra and became its president for like 25 years. Um, he widened his circle of friends. All the while, he was fixing up these houses and selling them to the kind of people that he really wanted to live in Langrove <laughs> artists, musicians. Architects, um, most of that puppeteers, those kinds of people. And, and by the mid 1930s, the village of Land Grove in the summer, at least the three months out of the year, was this thriving one of the place. Uh, but then this horrible threat came to his way of life, and it was called the Green Mountain Parkway, which was this road they were going to build right through the middle of the state. They were going to go right past Land Grove and ruin his way of life. And so he, he got himself elected to the state legislature in order to help fight it. Which isn't hard because there was only like 30 people in town who were registered to vote, and most of them had already served and really had no interest in going. You know? <laughs> but that was fine. That was the cool thing about it was that the legislature was dominated by people from towns like Lambert. And every town had a legislature. Each <laughs> town had a legislature. Lambert with with 80 residents had the same number as Brock, which was a thing. Um, it depended upon where you were from whether you thought that was a good idea or not. Uh, so your man uh, gradually became more and more important in, town, in, in the legislature. He became a member, the chairman of the Committee on Conservation and Development, which just its name alone, Conservation and Development, does give you an idea about the paradox the mom's already realized. And he um, began, a, a really single-handedly began the, the battle to um, ban billboards in Vermont. He introduced the legislation to found the natural, the, the Water Resources Board. He became hugely into forestry issues. He became very involved in conservation as an environmentalist. And this is very important. And one of the, the thing about his generation of people, he became very close to like Dorothy Canfield Fisher, um, other people, is that they went beyond just the physical landscape as the appeal. It was the way of life, the small town, the interpersonal relationships, the involvement in government. That was the great appeal that Vermont had. And so he did all these actions in order to try to save the Vermont that he'd come to love so much. But of course, when he was speaking about trying to preserve Vermont, he was really speaking about changing. He was just, it wasn't he wanted to keep it the same way it was. He wanted to make it approximately what he thought it should look like, which is, is fine. But what he wanted to look like was that the important things it had to remain, the way of life was dependent on it remaining on a small scale. That was the thing about it. So, in 1939, Governor Aiken appointed him to the Development Commission. And he was one, there was a chairman, he was one of the other four members, and he became very involved in promoting skiing as a, as I mean, every time I have a ski pass at Stowe, and I always like to put my bags down next to the fireplace that says, has his name on it, Sam Ogden, um, in, in the Mansfield Lodge. Uh, he, you know, uh, he actually worked at Big Brahma, um, he installed, personally installed the first chairlift there and then took tickets and things like this. He never became rich. Um, he measured the values like in other, in other ways. 
and he became, um, finally in 1947, um, the new governor, his name was Gibson, decided that um, he didn't like the development commission the way it was, so he fired four members of the board. The only one he kept was Ogden, and he put Ogden as the chair. So now, and then Sam Ogden plunged himself into trying to do the work of the development commission that was trying to sell Vermont as having a very uniquely rural way of life. And um, there was a, a book that came out in 1948, which was written by a guy named Earl Newton, who at the time was president of the Vermont Historical Society. It's called The Vermont Story. And <clears throat> he said this about Sam Ogden. Um, no booster. Sam Ogden first served as a member of the Vermont Development Commission and in 1947 became its chairman. Yet he has no vast plans to lure great industries into the state, nor to promote a great wave of indiscriminate tourist travel. And you say, well, what kind of a development commissioner doesn't want industries in the state? Um, you know, this industry kind of sounds like a, something a development commissioner should do. Uh, but that wasn't what he thought Vermont should be. He didn't think that's what his appeal was. Uh, he did not want to see Vermont destroyed. And when they say the, uh, a, a great wave of indiscriminate tourist travel, um, they, people in the state, like him, often held up other places as examples of what, how tourism can go wrong. Cape Cod, Florida, which are like sea. Vermont would attract a small number of really elite tourists. People like Sinclair Lewis, you know, people who made their living with their grades and not their hands. And if this sounds really class driven to you, well, yeah, it was. It certainly was. But that's what they wanted. They thought that there was such a thing as too much tourism, too much development, and that these are the things that might destroy Vermont. And so, um, you know, because what makes Vermont special is that people have a chance to participate in the, in the affairs of their community. It must exist on a small scale. Now, um, the, the sound is terribly loud, and I can repeat what's said afterwards, but I would like to show you three clips from a movie that was made in 1949 by the Development Commission under the direction of Sam Ogden um, that were meant to promote the state. He commissioned these movies and was intimately involved in the making of them. And this is Vermont Development circa 1949. So I'll just tell you quick, quick, um, three quick. Vermont, to those who named it, meant a land of friendly green mountains, a land perhaps not easy, but rewarding in its response to those who loved and won it, and made the term Vermonter a symbol of resourceful and contented independence. To the many who visit Vermont today, its meanings are as varied as their expectations, and the pleasures it affords are by no means always measured in money. The waters are open to holiday makers with yachts, They're open to those who like to dive and swim and bask on the hundreds of beaches. Recreation may be as active or as restful as the age and disposition of vacationers may prefer, although there is ample evidence that in Vermont, years seem to do little to abate a youthful zest in living. Some visitors enjoy the facilities of family resort centers while others choose the more rural Vermont of apple blossoms signaling spring in hillside orchards. Some prefer summer horseback trips over miles of little traveled roads and woodland trails, trails which turn to red and gold when autumn shimmers northward through the mountains. And of course, there are the famous mountain slopes where snow lies crisp and deep throughout the winter. What can Vermont mean to you? Well. If you're an artist like William Chaldack, it will mean an infinite variety of subjects for your brush and canvas. To Sam Ogden, it has meant the creative satisfaction of restoring a once abandoned community to vigorous life, largely by the work of his own hands. Okay, so three things about this. One, if I was the chair of the government commission and I was dispersing the money for this movie, I would totally want to be in I would, I would be like, well, you can't. I, I want to be in it, you know. <laughs> um, two, nothing says development in a state like people playing croquet. <laughs> and three, nothing that involves yachts is not measured in money. Did you hear that line? But I mean, you get the idea of what they're talking about. I mean, this is not like Vermont's moving forward. Look out, New Hampshire, Vermont's going to, 
You know, it's very much so in a specific way of life, which they um, increasingly um, are selling. There's a lot of tourism. There's a bit here with Norman Rockwell near the end. And Vermont will mean to you, as it has to me, a place to visit, a place to work, and a place to live. It will mean the church on the common, or perhaps on the hill. And above all, it will mean a community which is home. And the thing that's really difficult about it that these people face, but probably didn't recognize, I think, well enough, is that the community isn't the church and it's not the houses. It's the people. And if you take a place like Lambert, and it, I'm not meaning to give St. Martin a hard time, but he loved the people who were there when he arrived. And he wanted to turn it into a, uh, he wanted to bring in the people who he thought would benefit from this amazing way of life. Pe musicians like Nathan Milstein and Vladimir Horowitz used to be regular people who stayed there. And he wanted to, he loved the people who were there, he wanted to bring in new people, and he wanted to stay the same size. Something has to give, you can. And he loved the landscape when he arrived, which was a grazing landscape. And by the time you get to the 1950s, when there's almost no one left in town except for Sam Arvin's friends, it's a different landscape. It's a recreational landscape. It's a vacation landscape. It's not a working landscape anymore. And meanwhile, the children of the original 1890 Swedes, had, had they, some of them had tried to claim to hang on in Land Grove and through the 1940s. But the only evidence of the Swedes at that point was two of the original, one, a married couple, Axel Nielsen and his wife Hilma, who were now in their 80s. Um, but otherwise, the, none of the Swedes were left. The children had gone to White River Junction, Brattleboro. They worked in the machine tool industry in Springfield, Rutland, Arlington. They, they moved to the places where their jobs were. And the jobs they had were um, sign painters and working in lumber yards and driving trucks. You know, they, what, what was left for them in Land Grove? There was nothing for them there. And Sam Hounders didn't want to drive them away, but he didn't want it to grow, and he wanted new people there, and something had to give. Now, interspersed through this movie is this running story, it's like four different episodes, of this guy who is this really mean-spirited real estate agent. And, and this young couple from Connecticut come up and they want to buy a Vermont house and move to Vermont. And he puts them through all these humiliating exercises to know whether or not they actually will sell them the house or not. But here's the actual end of the movie. This is the conclusion. You know, sometimes folks call me crotchety and stubborn. Yes, they do. But the way I feel about it, this isn't a big town. And we don't have room for those that don't fit in. I think there's a lot weird going on there. Number one, was it a thing in Vermont before I got here 25 years ago where like real estate agents decided to get to live in a town? <laughs> and that they looked like the gatekeepers on the human landscape. Um, and, but, I, I mean, for a development commission, clearly you say some people don't fit in. I can tell you it's not doesn't fit in. Black people don't. Gay people don't. Catholics don't be too Catholic. You know what I'm saying? I mean, clearly, like, what kind of development commission is like, well, we want these people going, which excludes, we want white Protestant middle-class families as well. And, I mean, one thing also, the, the biggest thing that jumps out about this to me, um, and you know, it's home, it will mean a community we'll which just is a little bit. You know, sometimes folks call me crotchety and stubborn. Yes, they do. But the way I feel about it, this isn't a big town. What are the chances that these two kids will be living in this town after they turn 18? <laughs> and it would be super hypocritical of me to complain too much about heterosexual families of four moving to small Vermont towns and buying houses, since that's what I did. And my kids, they loved Vermont when they were six, but I have a 15 year old and a 17 year old, and they can't wait to leave. Oh my God. They're dying to leave. And that's fine, because Vermont constantly needs an influx of new people. And we we're desperate for new people right now, for sure. But you need to also cultivate the persistence in the human landscape. Because what makes Danville, and probably Rochester, and other places a real community is multi-generational people. And, and who have a sense of the town's history and who have interfamilial relationships that go back and have shared experiences and know the town's 
history, and not the history like when it was founded, but the history like, you see that tree? There was a dog in that tree. I don't know how he got up there, but he fell out and landed on, that's how your grandmother made your grandfather. That's history. And it's, everyone in town benefits from that. And so you need to have that sense of balance. Um, and Sam Ogden got brought up, caught up in all these paradoxes as he moved through life. He thought that small towns way of life was the best possible way of living. And in order to save that, he became involved in increasingly large bureaucracies. He designed many of them and served many of the other ones that increasingly consolidated power in Montpelier. And one of the things he really wanted in the 1960s was a statewide land use law. And you could not get a statewide land use law through the old one time one vote legislature. And then in 1965, they reapportioned the legislature and a couple years later, Sam Ogden got the Act 250 that he always wanted, and he thought that the reapportionment of the legislature was the worst thing that had ever happened to the state. And you can't have both. And this is the problem. Vermont increasingly became trapped in the 20th century between the appeal of two different things. We want preservation, but we want development. We want tradition, but we want progress. We, in, in order to stay the same, we need to be increasingly creative. And the, sub, the, the subtitle of my book is about the paradox of Vermont in the 20th century. And increasingly, the, it can be summed up very easily. The paradox in the 20th century of Vermont people came around to was that making Vermont look the same takes a lot of work. And keeping Vermont natural takes a lot of work. It takes the reliance on expertise and increasingly large bureaucracies and people being told what to do with their land. And the decline of small towns is, a, is, is a clear, the important forces. But, that's necessary in order to save a lot of other things that Vermonters really value. And that's the central problem. And so I wrote this book, a first book I wrote, which is not anywhere near as good as the book I just wrote. And it came out in 2006, it's about the 19th century. And it's about team A and team B. It's about the urban people and the rural people and how they hate each other, right? And the conflict between team A and team B. In the 20th century, that's not accurate. In the 20th century, the conflict isn't between people, it's within people. And because everyone in Vermont is attracted to, the, the, the attractions are conflicting. And, and the, the, the attractions that are conflicting are conflicting within us. And so um, this is where we found ourselves, obviously, in the 1970s and 80s and up to the present. And that was sort of my understanding of the way that we go through the 20th century. The challenge is to have a creative, growing human landscape while also retaining a really strong sense of community, which is the very thing that people move here for. And if too many people move here, they destroy the very thing they're searching for. And so this becomes the internal problem that Vermont has. And I think we do a much better job in 2019 than we did in the 1880s of having respect for persistence in the human landscape, which is so important to have a strong community. Um, I'd like to think we do a much better job because they did a really horrible job of it at the beginning of the story. Uh, but I'm really interested in what you have to say. I, I guess the last thing I'll say is, uh, when I did a, a series of five of these programs around the state with the state librarian of Joy and with Amanda from the historical side. They always insisted we had to sit in a circle to discuss our community. Yeah. I think that's a lot of work, kind of. But I mean, at this point, I really want to hear about your community and, and how good a job you think you're doing. And, and where have you been and where do you think you're going as far as making it a, a, a town that changes in productive ways but still retains the best parts of the way of life that made it a place to want to be one of them in the first place, you know? So tell me about, tell me about Rochester. Yeah, please. We forestalled a lot of the problems that you're describing by allowing a second home development about 20 or 30 years ago to be built, which boosted out grandness. But two years ago, we ended up building a high school. It happened years, many years after it should have, yeah. because we had that that bubble of of, of vacation money, they yeah. call it, second homes, our our tax at a higher rate than first homes, and et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. We, you know, you know, we only we only reevaluate uh, value real estate every so often, and and the new homes that get built always get tax higher than the oldest homes with the oldest people living in them. But <clears throat> this town has to face all of the problems that you're describing, even though it looks from the outside like a thriving 
compact little village, it's dissolving, it's disappearing slowly. And when, um, when a house gets sold, like that uh, real estate developer, <coughs> property real estate developer, I always would like the house to be sold to somebody that's going to actually live in it. Yeah. And that doesn't always happen. Often it's somebody who's only going to come up for a few weekends in the summer. And now they get, you know, like the people in the Hawk development, they get to rent it out to other people even more easily with the Airbnb than ever before. I understand there's like dozens of Airbnb listings in Rochester alone. Yeah. Uh, it means that there are people in those houses, those otherwise empty houses, but they're not citizens. Never a community. Uh, the point about the effect on the community of a town becoming too overburdened with second homes um, became a really big problem in some places by the 1920s. Uh, Dorset, because it was so close to Land Road, was a great interest to me. This woman, Zephine Humphrey, who was from there, wrote an article and she said, um, the effect on the fiscal landscape is terrible because you have farms that turn into pleasure landscape, manicured lawns. And, but it's the human landscape. And, and also the town, you, you walk down Main Street in the winter and all the houses are dark. And it's, they're dark and foreboding. She said the problem is the human landscape. I mean, how many of those, how many of those back doors can you go to, to in order to borrow a cup of sugar? Would you do that, she said? You, you don't have to people, and they don't want to talk to you. And the thing about closing schools was a real big thing, like, you know, when the big wave of consolidation, and I, I was going all through that, and, you know, on the argument on one side was, well, you know, we want to have the kind of high schools that can um, prepare people to um, leave and be really successful in the outside world. And there were a lot of people like, well, we don't want our kids to leave. We don't want that kind of school. Um, and you say it's overdue. I, I, I appreciate that probably it was overdue. I don't know if Daniel's heading in that direction, but did, the high school is so central to the community. Like, people go out to see the basketball games, and let me tell you, the basketball, it's terrible. I grew up in Philadelphia. I mean, I played good high school basketball, but it doesn't matter, you know? So, I mean, that's a really hard thing is to go to school. That's historically is to, you yeah. know, in the case. Yeah. Actually, my son was the last graduate of high school, and um, I found it very sad. And um, and now this building, I still work at the school. Uh, this building is like a very sad building because it's not going to be reused. You know, the ceiling is falling off because it's not heated enough. So it's going to be an eyesore, and and it's and but the money has to be put in to maintain it. And uh, plus, we don't see any young people anymore. So uh, when you were talking about different generations, we stop almost having this. Like we are gradually losing young people because they, by the time they come back from Middlebury, you know, so they have been passed all over. Middlebury, Sharon, you know, and South Wilton. By the time they come back at six, seven o'clock at night, you don't see them and uh, they don't develop that community. We talked about, I, I had been on school boards for many years, and when we first started talking about um, closing the high schools, it's like, oh, the kids will still be socializing. That's not true, because they, naturally, they have their own friends, you know, in the new schools, mm -hmm. and they have no time to socialize with their old friends when they come home so late, and, and on, on weekends they have games over there, you know, over some mountain. Um, so there's nothing left enough. And my son, who graduated, like, I can relate to what you uh, you, you said. Uh, he graduated as the last graduated um, uh, class, part of it. And yeah, he he's in Boston in college, and uh, he just couldn't wait to. But and he's the only one because we moved here from Massachusetts. He's the only one who was born here. And my older kids were in Massachusetts, and uh, so they, yeah, they, they left, but DC and all this stuff. But I thought he would be the one, and maybe the only one would say, no. Because it's not mom, there's nobody left. I mean, besides, I, we want them to go. I believe, like, uh, that we need to have the kids go out to different cities and uh, you know to colleges and stuff and bring that experience here. Yeah. But why would they come back? I mean, there's no jobs. 
there's nothing to come back to. And that's what's lacking because, you know, my son who is in DC, he's working for the government, you know, and uh, he's like, there's nothing here for me. Like, you know, he's working for the de uh, Department of Defense. And uh, yeah, it's fun to come home for, you know, a long weekend, vacation, or Christmas, but that's it. Um, I'm not supposed to talk after me personally. That's, but I have two points about this. Number one um, is that um, there, I noticed this dynamic when I had kids in kindergarten, right, in, at Danville, is that you can look around once you know the kids and it's not very many of them, and you can figure out in kindergarten which ones are going to stay after they graduate high mm -hmm. school. You can even you know that. Yeah. Um, and the other thing is that, and I mean to say only nice things about land growth. And Land Grove is kind of like, in some ways, like a wonderful place, and in other ways, it's this cautionary tale of everything that can go wrong. Um, and you know Land Grove, right? There's, there's one thing that Land Grove, there's no kids. There's no kids. Yeah. There's, there's no middle class, there's no poor people, there's no middle class people, there's no young families in Land Grove. Land Grove and Brookfield both fought painting of their roads. But they don't want people driving through town. That's I'm, it's kind of like a secret. Sometimes I feel like I'm telling people that land grow even with this. Yeah. If my book appreciably increases traffic in town, they're going to hate my guts. You know? <laughs> I'm being serious. But there's no kids there. And, and that is a real problem. Anyway. Yeah, please. Yeah. So just mm -hmm. my numbers, the Rochester population is around 1,100 people. <coughs> it's aging and shrinking among oh, lots okay. of other small towns in Vermont and rural America. So uh, there have been recently, in the past year, a number of community conversations around what we want Rochester to be, what we want to preserve, what needs to change. I think what we're seeing and saying is a lot of what you were describing, that there's a tension between you want to keep the same, but in order to stay the same, you have to change. And is the change OK or not? So we have this dilemma to deal with. Um, and we haven't figured out yet how to how best to resolve it. But, yeah, there have been some very strong statements about we don't want to be like a week's We want to be a real town. You know, it's a real working town that, yes, has some retirees and some second homeowners, but it's a real town, too. And you know, when, when the ski resorts built all the condos on the mountainside, uh, and it was, for those of us who think that way, that was a good thing. I think it helped preserve Rochester as, as a real town. Um, so uh, we're facing a lot of the same questions. Um, the, but, what we've also learned is that um, there are, in some of the towns in central Vermont, people in their 30s are coming back to small towns yes. because it's a choice of the way of life. You know, young people will go away to the big city, have the big city experience, but some, not all, uh, and maybe even people who never lived in Vermont previously are seeking a rural life experience because of the kind of community interactions you're describing. It's a great place for those guys. It's a great place for kids. Yeah. It's a, it's a, exactly. So it's a whole lifestyle. Until age until like 12. <laughs> no, it's uh, six, this is great because then, but then again, what, I, you know, if I had, we moved here, but had I known that there's no high school, I would never choose Rochester because no. it's like, okay, my kid will go to school for six years and then off, you know, so do we need to move? Because I'm not going to go to uh, his or her games, like, or practices like travel 40 minutes or longer in winter time. Yeah, you so, I'm sorry. Yeah. Uh, as a, a young person a long time ago, <laughs> I moved to Vermont for a particular reason uh, because I already had the understanding about uh, the climate emergency. And I think it's really important we have a high school. I'm not too worried that we aren't going to reopen the high school because actually today in California, the power company has turned off the power for a few days because of forest fires. You're looking at large populations stressing about a new world that we're living in. And I think in this conversation this song, we have to start paying attention that in a global situation, Vermont's climate is livable. Yes, definitely. And this, and I'm, I was shocked that Phil Scott started giving people money to come to the state because they're gonna, 
they're going to be coming. You know, you start having major problems with grid systems. So what happened in the past that you spoke about was actually setting a foundation for what we're going to be dealing with now. Because being able to maintain uh, off the grid is a critical issue. Growing food is a critical issue. And by the way, in Vermont, we do have a desert most of the year. And actually, for a lot of people, I'm in an agriculture. And the situation is, it's difficult to grow now. It's not the same as it was 10 years ago, 15 years ago. We're finding it harder to grow food. So if these are real issues, we should be looking at them seriously and how we may be in a situation of dealing with, where are we going to put everybody? Yeah. It is, it, and this comes up, the um, climate refugees, at sure. a bunch of my talks, for sure, and um, we should really more conversations and talks. Um, and it's always the same thing that's been the case in Vermont for like 100 years, which is, well, okay, growth is fine, but it has to be done right. Mm -hmm. there's, there's a certain way of doing growth that's, that's the right way, and we don't exactly know what it is, but we know what it's It's one tank, of gas, one tank of gas from New York City. Yeah, we, we don't want to go through a way that spoils the, the, the physical or the human landscape. You know? Yeah, please. So, um, okay, um, I had my daughter came up here at a farm, and I came up here, we were coming up here, and I moved here. But I moved here because of farming, I moved here because of the way of life. And I feel like Vermont didn't modernize, and that was a good thing. And now we're in this kind of postmodern, where we're, we're because of we can't sustain our lifestyle. That wealthy lifestyle cannot be sustainable. And we're a model for really the small town living local. Um, you know, how do we stop fossil fuel? We look or stop driving that much. And we're a great infrastructure. Rochester is a great model and infrastructure. Um, I actually was part of a international uh, think tank about um, if the world ended and how we're going to rebuild. Um, we took five projects, one of them was studying this valley and looking at how much it has already of being sustainable. And it always has been, it's very hard. Like I said, during the 30s, when there was a depression, the didn't even notice it was happening because it's always been hard. Yes, we've never been that modernized, but and we've never had the cream of the crop kind of thing, but we're hard working and we're very sustainable, we, we, we do things ourselves. I think that, those qualities are what gonna bring people here. And farming in New England has grown. And, but the young people are interested in farming, so I see, I do see there's going to be growth. I think we're in a low right now, but I think if we can see ourselves as a model and market that, that be, you know, that's, that's about designing how do we want to grow. But we want to grow, but we want to sustain our values. And that's how I've always looked at Vermont. Vermont is about old, old world values, but also, you know, really envisioning and thinking. I mean, you know, new world thinking with old world values. That's how it's that's a sustainable model, isn't it? Yeah. Yeah. Should be uh, something that other people yeah. Love, you know, have themselves in. Yeah. yeah, and instead of like mowing down houses, it's more like take those houses and make them multi family houses. Or, or you know, like the redesign what we have and having some design. I mean, New York City holds, like from New York City, New York City holds 16 million people um, during the work day and 9 million live there. And it does it because it's designed as an infrastructure. Design is good. So being prepared, not being blindsided by what's happening, being aware and designing is, is a good idea. So I think this whole idea of what we're talking about being a vision in Rochester, it's just getting to us talking about what do we want to preserve, what do we want to promote, who are we? Yeah. That's all good stuff. I'm glad you're, that you're so optimistic. I mean, I've, I've heard a variety. Not everyone is as optimistic well, as you. you know, know, it's like it's we're, in the, we're in the glass. You can be half full or half empty. It's your, it's your total person. You know, how do you want to look at it? Yeah. Well, I moved to Vermont in 1985, and to tell you the truth, I wouldn't want to live any other place but Vermont, because I was born with bronchial asthma, and the air here is much cleaner <laughs> than the air in New York or any other place that I've lived, I've lived in Tucson, Arizona. And due to the weather, the way the weather changes, it helps me to breathe. 
the warmth in the summertime. I don't have problems with my rheumatoid arthritis or my fibromyalgia. <laughs> the only thing I don't like is the gold bond, pop a palm. <laughs> so, but there's nothing you could do about it. That grows everywhere. Mm -hmm. But I would never move out of the state of Vermont. Mm -hmm. I love it here. Yeah. It's real and you know, it's it's uh, they got they have the most wonderful source of maple syrup. <laughs> you can't find that in any other state in the United States where they make it the way they make it here. Mm -hmm. And people love it. I have given it as gifts at Christmas time to my families that are in New York. I have a you know, that lives in Connecticut. I got, uh, I had a sister that lives in Abbotsport, British Columbia, on the west coast of Canada. And everybody said it, that if they could move, they would move <laughs> here just to be in the, the beauty of how the uh, seasons change. Yeah. It's a very peaceful, way of life. Yeah. Right. Which is dependent on it being on a small scale. You know? Yeah, but Those I mean not be overwhelmed. Ah. Not be overwhelmed, but I mean yeah. it's just you know, why destroy something that's so beautiful? Yeah. By building great big buildings and big factories <laughs> that spill smoke and Well I think a lot of people would say the problem is that we are um, headed towards an unsustainable cycle. You know, we had a generation, a, a large um, cohort of people who moved here in the 60s through the 1980s through the 70s. And those people had moved mostly out of the tax pay bracket to the tax, you know, to, to needing health care and other things. And we have so few children and that we don't have, to, looking forward, you know, it's like unsustainable. We need to have a tax base. We need more people in their, uh, their 30s and 40s. They're earning because what's going to happen to our roads? So who's going to pay for the bridges? You know, and so, like demographically speaking, I mean, there's a lot of people who have some serious concerns about Vermont sustainability. You know, you know what I'm talking about. Yeah, because it is wonderful. It's, it's almost sounds like utopia. Yeah, this is maple syrup and beautiful trees, and I all love it too. Like we all love it, but. You know, it's like for people who need to make a living other than like, you know, being already retired or, yes, a lot of people move here that they can work out of home. But that's, that's a limited number of people. You know, they can like, you know, software engineers or something like that. That's, but that's a, that's a small percentage. But you know, other than that, it's like, when I moved here, it's like, okay, what do I do? I mean, in, in Boston, in Massachusetts, I, I, I worked as an accountant, you know, and said, okay, like with small children, do I want to travel all the way to White River Junction, you know, to get a job, or and anywhere over the mountain? It's here, like, uh, Irene proved to us that it's like we are stuck. If something happens, we are stuck. Yes, we are sustainable, where you can grow our own vegetables, but in, 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 if, there's, if we want to attract Still middle class and, and middle aged people or young people with families. I mean, it's 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 kind of you know it's not possible as, as the way I see it because it's like okay, I want to be uh, I want to volunteer my uh, child's school, but I can't if I'm like working in Middlebury and uh, I cannot come back for his practice because I'm too far away or if he's sick or something. It's just the distances. We it proved that the distances are so overwhelming, and um, and yeah, I love it too. But you know, like, I understand my son would not work here because could move back here because he couldn't support himself. Even like you talk about taxes, but the taxes are going up. So when we moved here from Massachusetts, oh yeah, for that money we'll just buy like a house and a pot, you know, and 20 acres of land, it's like, but then our taxes here are right now, like, almost as high as our friends in Massachusetts, it's, so it's, it's demographically for months, like, I mean, some, the crazy people touch is a team time off, like, who's going to pay for the schools? And the yes, schools who's going to pay for those taxes? Yeah, I mean, I think, I think, well, what kind of people? No, but, no, no, well, whoever wants to be here, 
it, I can't really control who comes and not doesn't come, but this valley has like 2,500 people. If we had 5,000 people, we'd have more stores, we'd have more jobs. You know, that's what, and I think we, um, Bill Biederman did this whole, where are we gonna be in 2020, almost in 2020, but back then when we were looking at it, researching what, what, what we had, we had 200 uh, small businesses back then. That started with people who came here in needs. Um, but they kind of got older and retired and, and, and our small businesses have actually declined. If we had a more new wave of people who had started more new businesses, we'd have to need more shops, we need more this and that. And the idea of being local is that we'd have more shops that we wouldn't have to go over the mountain to, to, for our needs. And if you had more people, you could just stay here and it would be okay. And yeah, but the economy, there's shops, there's like places available for us. Yeah, yeah, okay. But the people, the people who come here usually have music, yeah. and then they don't want to come here. You guys are This is where the conversation comes. <laughs> I love it. I love it. The flip side is that the restaurant side. But the flip side is that the couple flip sides. One is if the population here is too large, then you need something in terms of scale and the interaction that occurs in 1,100 people. It's twice or three times that. It's going to change. It, you know, maybe that's okay, but I think we have to recognize that that proportional change is going to uh, make, make a difference in terms of the interaction. The other thing is infrastructure required for growth. Whether it's a sewer system, water system, road systems, all of that. No, uh, you know, it's a step function. You can only go so long, but then you have to step up and invest more in infrastructure. And maybe that's okay too, but I think all I'm saying is that we have to recognize it's a very complex question. And there are a lot of things that have to be considered. We could double or triple the population of this valley without building another bedroom. And I'll play anti bedroom. Absolutely. But <laughs> everywhere in America, people are getting used to fast food, eating out, instant this, oranges in, 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 in August, and, and strawberries in January. And there's still a respected minority who enjoy what's called slow food. Slow food, food grown nearby, cooked slowly, it takes a while, but it's enjoyed for its terroir, let's call it. And I think people would like slow living as well, some of them. And that's what Vermont has to offer. I don't think we can advertise Vermont as a place where you can have it all. I don't think we're ever going to have it all. I think we ruin Vermont by, by letting people expect to have it all. I'm a little disturbed with this last mile connectivity. We still don't have last mile electricity in Rochester, but we have to have last mile broadband. And what that does is it enables people to live isolated lives in, 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 in isolated settings, when in fact the future of a place like Rochester is a bigger village, a more populous village, not sprawl. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Which has the, the, the compact Vermont village in which you can see the countryside on all sides, you know, um, has a real second residence. It goes back to pure America. Um, when you're speaking about the small scale, one of the things about these community conversations you keep bringing up is um, the local food movement and um, the uh, farmers markets and things like that. And this is you know, a wonderful. And the, the one concern I have with that is that things that, that are going well with things at farmers markets, they're expensive. And a lot of people can't afford them. And so I mean, the, Vermont has a long history, like a century long history of engineering the landscape, its policies in favor of one set of people and not another has generally speaking been wealthy people. I mean you know and you need to have to be a democratic society. Well the bottom that's line, correct. Vermont's farmers can't sustainably farm in competition with Midwestern farmers who are mining the topsoil. That's just not possible. Mm -hmm. The the cornflakes are always going to be cheaper than the corn on the cob. Mm -hmm. They just are. And we, we, those of us that buy corn for 50 cents a year recognize that. Mm -hmm. And sometimes, if it takes you, that's if we eat less, and it would probably be okay that way. <coughs> yeah. That's how, that's 
how the meat eating is going to end slowly. But it's going to get so expensive to get decent meat, meat that you can safely eat, mm -hmm. that 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 people will eat a lot less of it. Well, we have a, we're an all organic beef town, so I have a, I, we have three farms with organic beef, so we don't have a lot of problem with that. And we have lots of plants, and we have lots of kinds of people who actually grow their own food. So we're yeah. lucky. But, but he yeah, has to market it though. in a far way. It's expensive. It's to stay profitable. Yeah, if one ate it, it would be less. Yeah. The people who make, who, who grow beef locally, can't sell it entirely locally. Oh, I know that. I know that. But there's so many people who have their own, okay. own pig, their own cow. They're all gardens. I mean, that, I think that's, if we did it more collectively, that would be the way to go. And little by little, the state is recognizing that it has to create exceptions for the small is beautiful thing. Mm -hmm. um, you know, the state made a terrible mistake when they said that, well, all of the ceilings in a classroom have to be 10 feet high. Well, we have to close our high school and build a new one. 30 years ago, 40 years ago, whatever it was. Because our ceilings weren't high enough. And when, when I went into in business with a bed and breakfast, the fire marshal came and said that I had to build a separate additional stairway that went from the second floor directly to the outside. And it took us five years to get the state to agree that it was going to be OK for people in case of fire to open the window and go out on the porch roof if I put a ladder up against the porch roof. I think Jeanette probably answered us in till age, and these things do tend to run over. <laughs> um, I did want to, you do want to say something. That well, I'm probably the person that's been here longer than any of you. <laughs> but um, this is the first time I did. I read about, I studied about Vermont when I was in college. Mm -hmm. And believe me, it was horrible because they were telling how the mountains were stripped by the paper companies, you know, and the environment was in terrible shape. And then I finally came here, and the first time was 1946, and uh, for a visit. And I, you know, but I, this was up into the North Hall. Now the houses all up there had been farms when you were telling about when the farms came. And they were sold to college professors, music. Joe Shankman's family, fine musicians, classical musicians came here. This is their summer home. And then they retired and they would stay here, you know, or something. And, but we came back to a house in the hollow where my husband's family had grown up for generations. And um, it was interesting because, for one thing, just going to Vermont, you know, all my cousins and everybody said I came from the ocean down in Massachusetts. And, what are you going up there to be a hick? What are you doing to do such a dumb thing, go up there and be a hick? You know, that was exactly what they said. Gonna be a hick. So when we get up there, Don is the one who has generations that went back and back, my husband, and because some of the neighbors, uh, farmers, uh, I was some damn city person that came up here. I grew up on a farm on the coast of Massachusetts. <laughs> and um, anyway, I noticed that there was a big difference between the village and the hills outside of town. If you lived in town, you were a town. And even now, I just came down to live at the park house, and somebody said, oh, now you're a tummy. <laughs> and they said that way back when I came down for a while and lived in the condo for three years, you know. And I said, well, what was I before? <laughs> you know, a hick? You know, what was a hillbilly? You know, what did the, but there was definitely a difference. But I can see how it went back, because the people who all originally lived in these houses up on, out of town, up on the mountain, they only could come down into the village on Saturday night and do their shopping. Us and Bucky and came down to their shopping when they never came down any other time. And then, not only that, but they, um, the, the high school, there were all little village schools. There were how many up there in the hollow? I think there were eight, you know, in just that one area because, and each one would have a couple of families in it. And 
anyway. They, to go to the high school, they, this was a problem. How did they get their kids to the high school? So our place, actually, is because it got abandoned so they could get the kids to high school and they moved into the village. And, um, and it came up for sale, you know, and they came to see my husband's mother, who always came back in the summer and stayed with guests, with friends or anything, you know, because this is where they went to school. So they came back for the old girls' picnic. Uh, what did they call it anyway? Uh -huh. They had, didn't have a union of the class. They had the old girls picnic. If you graduated from the school, they had a big picnic every year for all the girls that had graduated from Rochester. <laughs> so that was, and Don's grandmother had to come back every year to be a niche there all summer and work on the farm with the harpies and do things, you know. But always stayed up there on the hill. And so, and then I noticed there was a big competition between the farmers in the hill and the farmers in the valley. It was the Martins and the McCoys. It was, you know, <laughs> <laughs> definitely, you know. And I just couldn't get over this difference between whether you were a hillbilly or a townie, you know. <laughs> and, um... Are you pretty satisfied with the way you're off the way you're off the ball? What? Are you pretty satisfied with the way you're off the ball over those 60 years? Oh, I, 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 you know, I've been very understanding of it, but just your talk made me, it was interesting because now I can see how they felt about me, you know, <laughs> and I've been trying to understand it, but now I can, I can see, you know, these other places, and then it was recently at a memorial for one of the families that up there on the hill that were professors, you know, and family had kept the place going for a few generations, and somebody said at the memorial, well, you know, the Crookshanks and so and so, they listed us in with all the other professors and the, you know, when we were the ones that came back with the roots, you know, but nobody else had. You know, it was just interesting. But when I came back also, I mean, when I came here to live, um, year round in 63, actually we came up here on a honeymoon and it was in the 40s. And Don had to walk me all around the hollow to see all the old neighbors that were still there, you know, on the farm, and introduce his wife, you know. Well, they had just got electricity. And they were all excited to show me their toaster or their refrigerator or something, but they didn't get power on the hill until 1948. There wasn't a cement, there wasn't a paved road through Vermont until Route 100 in 1935 or 32. It was all dirt roads, you know. So who would come here? It was too hard to get into the Rochester. I mean, Vermont, it protected it. And, but what changed, I mean, the exciting thing to me is if I read about it in college about how they were stripping the mountains and the environment was so badly treated, look what it is now. So why should we worry? If we want things to change, if we, our heart is with it, we're open, it's going to happen. Now, the interesting thing we can say about the restaurants, I haven't been into Sandy's or to the cafe without people saying, I met people in Sandy's that had come all the way from, her mother was visiting from Alaska. She lived in Connecticut, and she, I can't remember where her brother, but she got them there to come and eat at Sandy's, drove all the way. <laughs> I met them there, and they said something about how I said, "Would well, you want to see the view? Come home with me, and I'll take you up to the hollow." You know the view, and they were just thrilled. But then my son tells me, and he's in New Hampshire. He said he's driven up the several times here just to eat at the cafe. Mm -hmm. That place is packed. Yes, but they don't have any help. They cannot hire. I know. They need no. help, and they want yeah. to sell because. But they I have no. no I think it's really sad to, to see the difference without having this. Because there's no people to work yeah. here. Well, they we are, need. They're trying to sell and they, because they can't have staff, enough staff to run it. I think okay. we have to think about it. Yeah, so there's a lot of jobs. There's a lot of jobs. And I'm sure you'll I think it's wonderful that you have the envisioning of Rochester. I mean, it's just because as long as the status quo is over half the housing stock is summer homes, you're not going to have housing stock available for people to live here because no. 
you know, there's not building going on. That's yeah. the existing housing stock is what's available. And I was surprised the first time I did a fundraiser for the library, um, mailing out, doing bulk mail. Over 60% of the envelopes were going out of Vermont. Yeah. Um, that it starves the school of, of students when it's all it's when more than half your houses are are vacation houses. Um, and I don't know what legally or otherwise you can do about that. I mean, in our society based on a house goes up for sale, anybody can buy it. You know, is there a way to give preference to a full time homeowner in a sale process. Maybe it's uh, an incentive know. more than preference. Maybe maybe there should be an incentive yeah, there's no incentive based thing and, and also an incentive base for for um, people to rent their houses to like not just vacationers, not just Airbnb, but um, some sort of incentive for you know to be a, a long term yeah. landlord as well. It's tough when you've got any town after town that has this dynamic is that, I mean, a couple of new people and a couple of um, summer homes are fine, but when it reaches a critical mass, the people yeah. who have long-term attachment to the town become resentful, mm -hmm. and no one wants that. So I think as long as this is this determined as, you know, like a sleepy, like nice, uh, fresh town with no, like, businesses and stuff, like maybe a couple of cafes and stuff, like a restaurant maybe, if there's people work there because there's not then it's okay because it's wonderful it's like fresh but then if we think if we, we I don't think we can envision it as a you know town where people can move with families because they can't work they can there's no high school so it's like yeah it's just like okay it's fine when it is like a kind of a resort which is going back to those towns to those times, you know, that they were talking about. But other than that, you know, like I had, you know, my kids, it's wonderful. I was my kid, yeah, like my youngest, and it was wonderful to raise, you know, in, in this, uh, up on the hill, because, you know, up in the halls. But after that, there was a time, there was a few years there, where we had families moving in and were homeschooling their children. Yeah, but I, how many I families? Five? Yeah. yeah, and I thought that was wonderful. I mean, they brought new people in and they were very re receptive of change and, you know. And oh, but I'm hearing both that <laughs> there are no but, jobs yeah. and there are no people to yeah. fill the jobs that we have. Yeah. yeah. There's jobs that are here, but the kids don't want them. Yeah. Or they're not here to take them because they're mm -hmm. going to school. Uh, that's well, well, we'll get this. Well, they all have a waiter or waitress. Or, yeah. Uh, no one wants to work at the dairy farm. Mm -hmm. um, you know, there's there's that opportunities works. for work, but it's not what the kids Wants. want to do. Yeah. And just my opinion is that you know, it's a big world out there. Uh, education is everything. Uh, you educate them the best you can, and they want to use it. They want to see what's on the other side. They want to see where everything's going on. So they, they want to experience it. You know, I'm not, I don't fault them for doing that, but it's 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 a hard to, to make the money here and survive. It's tough. It is. But, but I I don't I don't feel pessimistic at all about the overall picture of Rochester because I think it it can be accomplished with a, a sort of overarching vision and and careful planning. I think that's what a lot probably urban planning is about, but we're doing Rochester planning. And I think if you have a vision where you kind of pull together all those pieces, I think you can accomplish what we want to accomplish. I'm working out. I mean the people are moving here. Uh, my neighbor next door is 28 years old. He just got married. He's been here a couple of years. He works for some. She's a nurse. He works for um, Sun Common. And uh, you know he's interested in homestead. Our neighbors before him. It was a lot cheaper from where he lives to live in Shelburne. Um, and then um, Ben Falk has moved here for farming, from agriculture farming, teaching pet from agriculture farming. I can see again be, uh, this being an education area for teaching sustainability. You know, it's not, it's not school school, but maybe adult education. 
it's going to shift. I think we're a little bit low, and I think we're really feeling sad that the school ended. But maybe an alternate school will grow up here. <coughs> I think we're in transition, but I think I'm from Connecticut, Stanford, Connecticut. My town is five times the good times where it used to be. In size, it's grown five times the population. The water's polluted. The traffic is crazy. People are just so fast, and everything is, I can't afford to live, live there. And um, I am so blessed. I feel so blessed to be living here. I've been living here 20 years, and I feel like, I still feel like, pinch me, I can't believe I'm living here. It's hard, though. It's not easy. And I think, um, I, I think there's a lot of possibility here. And it's just all the pieces, <coughs> and just, you know, all the possibility, and then just weaving them together in the right way to, to encourage and, you know, attract people to this area who will be here permanently. I it's a way of life really that I don't like because I just met a gentleman who was probably 28 years old and he moved up from uh, New Jersey and he loved it here. Uh, you know, he, he, he just thinks it's great to be in a rural area in the communities. Yeah. Um, yeah, does he work two jobs? He does. You know, but that's what brings people here is a way of life. Mm -hmm. okay. That's right. You need to appreciate those things. If you don't appreciate them, then you're not going to be here or you don't want them. Yeah, I think there's a lot of opportunity here. It's just the mindset that that's what you want to do. It's a lifestyle choice, I think. Yeah. Yeah. It's, it is. Um, I'm, I guess I'm one of those like refugees, not a climate refugee, but I would say like an urban metropolitan area refugee. Mm -hmm. I'm from Atlanta. We've been here almost two years, um, year and a half. And and that was the, the the draw was is the small town, it's the community, it's yeah. the it's the vast open spaces, the beautiful mountains, it's the you know um, the air is the air is fresher.
place where the square dancing was. So she could get on the train and go square dancing every Saturday night. I mean, when we came here, we couldn't do anything like that. The population was 900 when we came here. And then it went up to 1,200. And now it's dropping down again. Yeah. And if we had a bus service here through from Killington to Montpelier, it would be even better. Try to imagine 4,000, you know, compared to it. So you, you understand, like, this is central paradox, which is that Vermont desperately needs people like him. Um, but, you know, for, for development. Um, but if Vermont um, developed too much for people like you, what kind of care about storage and everything in it? And so where do you find that perfect balance, that sweet spot of development <coughs> for preservation, you know, it is tricky. Okay. There's a sweet spot somewhere. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah. But the planification is really key. There's so many people, young people, who can't even afford a car. Cars are so expensive. Um, and if you don't have more, if you don't have mass transit, and you just have a bus system, I know Middlebury put in a bus system to now to over the to uh, to route to to ski area. But if you had a bus system, I was going to can't afford a bus system. In, but I mean, it's safe for that. I bought a bus system along the way to highways. That would have a little bit of it about getting there. So just had a thought, what, talking about bus systems. Uh, Middlebury sends a bus to Hancock every morning to pick up school kids. Hmm. I'm just wondering what the law, accommodation, whatever would be for those people trying to commute to Middlebury to a job would be to catch a ride on a school bus. I mean, what would be the thresholds of rules, regulation, of they laws? They can't because it's, it's, it's like a li liability. No, well, like, no, yeah, no, it's no, very, no, very college has created a bus school bus right. to, 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 to shoot a Well, to the top of the mountain. Right, but if they could send it to all the way to Hancock, it would be great. And then they had to get from Kelly to like huh? Howard. It's park for tours and it's park for Right, but, it's, but, but if Middlebury schools sent, instead of a school bus, if they sent the stagecoach, right. like Sheridan Academy does, right. Right. people trying to commute to work could right. also use that same... Right. How much, what would it take for Middlebury schools to contract with stagecoach right. instead of the supervisory union bus. Right. So we have to talk about that. We have to talk about that. Yeah. I mean, there's a way to accomplish almost anything if you're just creating. Transportation is always the, like the biggest uh, uh, expense in a, in a budget supervisory union budget. So like right. it's uh, so yeah, but it will be very expensive. The bus isn't full. It will be very expensive to send those unless they are unless they are full. But well, but if the town. This town <coughs> contributed to that service financially. Right. I mean, I don't know what the deal is with Sharon Academy, but though the, all those kids here in Rochester, if if the parents are paying for it, if Sharon Academy's paying for it, you know how the finances run on that. Because the Sharon Academy started losing kids, and uh, a couple of years ago they said there's no way they would even take our children. And uh, we're like, well, they wouldn't even talk about like bosses. But now when they started losing the kids, it's like, oh, yeah, we'll take your kids. And then we'll also send the bus, you know? So it's like, yeah, that's yeah, but that's the question. Like most kids, you know, it's like it's different, different. But the real question change. is who's financing the bus? That's what, that's what Jeanette is asking. And I'm curious about that too. Yeah. Supervi supervisor the unions. No, it should be a state level. But the state doesn't have money even like I mean, to, to for like for the school lunches anymore. So it's a uh, so it, many people pay for a bus running around with one person in them. Yeah. You'd think it was just a matter of logistics. Right. I know that you should, like they do car share in Burlington. We do car share. I mean, there's, there's yeah. Yeah, well, like, what, what to carry was like the time that's like I remember before we moved here, and it's like my son was like, oh my gosh, yes, yeah, this is probably if anything, this will take uh, take people from the cities and to the you know to Vermont, to New Hampshire, whatever. You know, maybe some moved, you know, and uh, so I, you know, this is like yeah, it will be wonderful, but um, I'm 
sorry about the pessimistic, but it's like again, I, I believe it's a wonderful <coughs> community for like the people probably wouldn't want to change it. People who have second homes, or people who are retired here, people who can work out at home. Or in the few businesses when we moved here, there was old studios, there was in a uh, yeah, in the traditions the only one at um, advanced illuminations like while we moved here. Uh, and they are still functioning. But, and chips and bits. But chips and bits were here, they moved. So like out of like no, they were not a business. They were not a business. Okay, so but they are not here. So so out of six businesses, I think we are down to two. So it, and the other like restaurants, they can hire people to to work. And and also the pay is lower, transformation is still functioning well because we always offer like bigger uh, wages than locally, you know, people could afford to pay because they sell, you know, at, all over the world and they say it's not like locally. But um, other businesses, you know, they, they don't pay well. Hardware needs a uh, store, needs to work on, on, on weekends. So sometimes I see young yeah. parents who like uh, don't work and I'm like, well, there's so many jobs here. like. What's going on? So Vermont, yeah, Vermont needs its maximum number of farms in the sense that we can at about 35,000. And after that, it was down, 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 yeah. right? And in 1935, they did this big, with the planning commission on the state level, did this big thing called the graphic survey. And they looked around and they looked at all the sectors of the economy, they were like, that one's going down, that one's going down, that one's going down. The only one that has an opportunity for growth is recreation tourism. Mm -hmm. That's, and they yeah. said, a tour of scheme like crazy. And what we came around to in 20 or 30 years was that those jobs, those people who had been independent farmers, that way of life, had been replaced by flipping burgers and changing bed sheets in hotels. And that's a very different way of negotiating your life. It's not just about being at work. And um, one of the things that really got me was that in the 50s, they were built, putting up all the screws right? You know, Killington and JP and all this. And the, the same argument was part of the government, but she kept wanting to throw money into access and the uh, local boys at the highway department kept taking the money and putting the money misappropriated to um, the uh, roads for local people used. And they had taken a hockey bag, you know. But they got those access roads gotcha. And the state decided, well, you know, these are the people we're going to put our resources in, not these people. Yeah. And I mean, it's a, it's a long history, and we're still trying to figure out, in some ways, like, how to get ourselves out of that. Um, although I'm not sure everyone thinks that putting state resources into well-to-do people as opposed to poor people is a mistake. I think it is. Mm -hmm.